I invite you to take your Bibles, please, and turn to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 1. We're going to go through all 22 chapters before we go home today. <laughs> Temptations, hidden snares often take us unawares. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bond servants the things which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated, if by his angel, to his bond servant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy. And heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us, from our sins by his blood, and he has made us to be a kingdom priest to his God and Father. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, and even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So is it to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance, which are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I read an article out of a magazine years ago. Don't remember the name of the magazine. Don't remember the name of the article. All I remember is it was talking about the history of our country in the 1800s. And there was this segment that went like this. Before the husband would go to work, he would be seated at the table with the morning paper. And he wanted to know what was going on before he left the house. And for Christian men and women, oftentimes they would say, let us see what God is doing today. Notice what, how they viewed the Bible and how they viewed the newspaper. Notice the newspaper basically was giving a con some type of a commentary on what the brothers and the sisters knew about the life of their city, their country, and whatever else. And we, I don't, well, I was going to ask the question. I'll ask the question, but don't raise your hand unless you want to. How many of you read the paper or watch the news in the morning before you go on your way to work or whatever else? Just like I thought, everyone. We still want to do that. I remember Dad we would take the Rocky Mountain News in the morning and the Denver Post at night, and he'd give the Rocky Mountain News a swift going over before he had to go to work. But the Denver Post, he'd spent a lot of time reading it before, before dinner and after dinner, and we had to be quiet while Dad had his sacred reading time to see what God was doing in Denver and particularly in Englewood during those years. We're interested. But it would seem to me that you and I have a mentality, or we should have a mentality, that when we take history and current events into account, we should always consider the place of our Lord in these matters. I remember reading that, and I thought, I'm not too sure that when I read the paper, I want to know what God is doing today. And I thought about it for a while, and I thought, okay, this is a working assumption. I'm assuming that God is doing things today, and I will see what's going on that he is doing. That's the way I kind of weaseled out of my position, I guess. But notice when we take history and current events, which is new history, 
history in the making, when we take these things into account, we should always consider the place of our Lord in these matters. So we want to look at Jesus Christ today in this first chapter. He's the Christ who reveals, he's the Christ who redeems, and he's the Christ who rules. So let's look at it, verse 1, chapter 1 of the book of Revelation. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant. Now, notice that we, what we see here is an introduction as to what the book is going to be all about. But what I want, to note, want us to notice is that it focuses on Jesus Christ. It does not focus on the prophecy. It focuses on the prophecy in relation to Jesus Christ. This is the revelation, not of things which are about to happen soon, but this is the revelation of Jesus Christ who will bring these things about and bring them about soon. The apocalypse is at the command of the Father. I, while going over this passage, notice how parallel it is to when the disciples were asking the Lord, uh, is he going to bring the kingdom back? And he said, it's not for you to know. He says, only the Father knows. And now at least we see that the Father and the Son know, and they're about to give it to the people of God. The apocalypse is at the command of the Father. This is a revelation of Jesus Christ. The revelation is at the directive of Jesus Christ to be granted to his bondservants. This is for us, and we should study it. And we should study it in context, in historical setting. And notice that the revelation is taken seriously, and it was intended to inform and edify the saints. Notice that the revelation was not only by the Lord, but also about him. It's an interesting structure in the New Testament, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And the argument oftentimes goes, the revelation of Jesus Christ, meaning that he is the one who is the source of passing it on, or he is the content and the object of the book. Well, if you try to follow it out in context, both of those positions stand, and some commentaries say it's both, that this is a revelation of the person of Jesus Christ, and it is a revelation made public by Jesus Christ. And so the revelation was not only by the Lord, but also about him. And at least in continuity, those two positions stand. Then I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Let me get off track just for a minute. But when you see all of the things that are going on with people who call themselves theologians, call themselves prophets, understand that the prophecies are not primarily to give facts about whatever's going on. But the prophecy is to focus attention upon God. That if somebody leaves the Lord out of the prophecy, in one way or another, you better make it suspicious in your thinking. Because as we notice here, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now, when we watch them on TV or hear them on the radio or read their books, where is Jesus Christ in all their predictions? Where is Jesus Christ in all that they're pointing to in the future? If Jesus Christ does not have a significant place in that prophecy, you better raise an eyebrow as you look at it. This is what we need to keep in mind. We must remember that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And the spirit of prophecy points not to just events that are happening, but points to worshiping the Lord. That if we're going to get into matters of really God's word, period, it should lead us to worshiping. But in the meantime, when it focuses on Jesus Christ, it makes it opens the doors quite easily to worship the Lord. The spirit of prophecy points 
to worshiping the Lord. So when we look at history, we see that Jesus Christ is the one who reveals and that Jesus Christ is the, revela the re revelation. And this is what we want to keep in mind always, that Christ who reveals in this instance is the revelation. And the Christ also who is the revelation is the redeemer. Revelation 1.5. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. Notice that redemption has its foundation in God's love. That when we speak of redemption, and we speak of our salvation, we need to have the love of God somewhere in the structure. Notice that his love is continuously active. I like the structure on this. From Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, all these great things, the ruler of the kings of the earth. And then notice, to him who loves us and released us. Notice, to him who loves, present tense. But more than that, it, its structure points that this love is a part of a permanent part of the characteristic of the one who loves us and released us from our sins. And notice that the verb changes when it comes to released. It speaks of a historical event. We speak of the person who presently and always loves us. He has loved us and he will love us on into eternity. And that in a period of time, he releases from our sins by his love, or by his blood. Redemption is based on love and driven by love. His love is continuously active. His love is basic to his character and his love is ever present. And redemption sets us free from so many things. But here we want to speak of being set free from the penalty of guilt. Notice that redemption allows for a new life. And he has made us to be a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Redemption allows a new life. Notice as believers, we're brought together and formed into a body that comprises his kingdom. We like to be a part of the family of God, and so we should. It's biblical. It's a reality. But notice this as well. As a part of our new life, we're brought together and formed into a body that comprises his dominion. We are a part not only of a kingdom that comes, but we're a part of the kingdom that is also the family. And notice he rules over us, and he rules through us. We believers are brought together and formed into a body that comprises his kingdom, and he rules over us, and he rules through us. And notice we also have the priestly duties as we intercede on behalf of our brothers and sisters. We have the privilege, we have the responsibility of taking other people's lives into prayerful consideration and pray for them. And as we do, we stand as a priest before God, also representing whoever it is at the time. We pray, say today, for Phyllis, who is in the hospital. We do that as a part of our priestly responsibilities and duty. And sometimes prayer is really very hard, but it is still possible. More than possible, it is probable. More than probable, it is a fact that many is the time when it's hard to pray, that is the time when prayer is the most needed. But this is our task. We are priests. We are part of the kingdom of God, and we are a part of that priestly body who remembers each other's, one another before the throne. And we have our priestly duties as we intercede on behalf of our brothers and our sisters. Now, notice that God's saints will also judge the world as well as angels. Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world 
If the world is judged by you, are you not competent to constitute the smallest law courts? And do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more matters of this life? We've many a times over the years laughed and chuckled about Paul having to go to the church in Corinth. If you take a look at Corinth and see what's going on in the church, if the church of Corinth is to the north, you want to start traveling south. That was really one messed up church. But notice it was still a part of the body of Christ. And therefore, Paul says, in so many words, it's time for you to get your act together. And if you can't even work through the smallest of problems, how are you going to judge the world? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? If the world is judged by you, are you not competent to constitute the smallest law courts? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more matters of this life? Notice what is in store for us as a part of the body of Christ. It isn't just going to heaven and walking down the streets of gold. Notice there is important tasks to be performed by the saints, and they will judge the world as well, the angels. The Christ who reveals is the revelation. The Christ who is the revelation is also the redeemer. And notice the Christ who is the revelation and the redeemer also is the ruler. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth. And no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? The Lord God rules over the hearts and lives of mankind. This is such a tremendous passage because you have Nebuchadnezzar getting back his common sense and really his sense of reality. And he is basically giving his testimony of how he was confronted by the the God of heaven and earth. And he says, all the inhabitants of the earth, when you compare them next to God, they count as nothing, but he counts as everything. Now remember, this is one of the most important and powerful potentates of all of history. And this is what he says about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All the inhabitants of the earth are counted as nothing, and he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth. And no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? Notice how great our God is. And sometimes we sell him short on how great he is. But Nebuchadnezzar has it straight for us. And notice in 135, I had to sneak it in. For I know that the Lord is great and that our Lord is above all gods. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and in earth, in the seas and in all the deeps. The one thing that we need to keep in mind, and it is a challenge sometimes, that he does, he, God is in his heaven and he does as he pleases. Sometimes what seems to be pleasing him isn't too pleasing for us, is it? But this is where we have to take the understanding of the goodness of God working out that which is good from that which is less than good. And the Lord God rules over the hearts and the lives of mankind. And when we seem to watch our country turn to be probably one of the most rebellious people that we've ever seen, at least in our time, we wonder where God is in all of this. And so we do read the newspaper somehow and we watch the news somehow, and we come to the point where we say, where is God in all of this? And sometimes the answer that we get is not really encouraging, except to say, God is in his heavens and he does as he pleases, and as he pleases is that which is good. And all things indeed do work together for good to those who love the Lord. It is in fact true that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. So notice that the hard times develop hope, sustain hope, and in that hope we find strength. Jesus is the almighty ruler. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, 
the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and releases us from our sins and by his blood. It is important for us that from time to time we stop and take a look at who Jesus is besides our Savior and our Redeemer. Let's not lose sight of the fact that Jesus Christ is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And let's keep that in mind when we see it seems like our country is going down in a, on a fast freight that we have Jesus Christ who is the King and he is in control. And many of you know that. I've heard some of us along the, the way over the period of time and that we will recognize that the Lord is the King of kings and the Lord of lords and he is our Savior. He is the Christ who rules. He rules over the hearts of mankind and they cannot say, what have you done? And it's, he is in heaven, in earth. He does as he pleases. He is the almighty ruler. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead. Notice who he is, the ruler of the kings of the earth. We should tell this to Biden. We should tell this to Putin. We should tell this to just about every governmental leader, whether he was elected or took it by gun. He still is submissive to Jesus Christ, whether he knows it or not, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. He is our Redeemer. He is our Savior. He is the Savior of mankind. But notice, he is the ruler of the kings of this earth. And for that, we thank him for his sovereignty and his fairness and his righteousness. And our Lord will visibly return. Behold, he is coming with the clouds. And every eye will see him, and even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. So many of the commentaries make mention of the fact that when they mourn, they are mourning because they recognize what they have done. And what they have done has been to their own condemnation and he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him and even those who pierced him all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him notice the contrast when he was ascended up into heaven comparatively it was a small group of people who witnessed it but when he returns it's going to be a small group nowhere it's going to be one large group of people who will see him coming and they will recognize who he is and they will recognize what they have done to him and they will recognize to their own hurt that the tribes of the earth will mourn over him and so it is to be, amen. And notice again in Zechariah 14, and the Lord will be king over all the earth. In that day, the Lord will be the only one and his name, the only one. There comes a time when Jesus Christ is not competing with anyone. He really doesn't compete now, except that those who don't follow him seem to think that they are competing rather successfully. But in the end, the Lord will be king over all the earth. And in that day, he will be the only one, and his name the only one. We look forward to that time. We look forward to that time when all things will be made right, when all things will be well, when all things will be working according to the goodness of God in terms of his graciousness, and all will worship him as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So it's important that we still take a look at what's going on. We need to read our newspapers and say, what is God doing? Well, I see what God is doing, but I don't know why. Well, we know why that in the end, all things will be down to his honor and to his glory. Blessed is the king. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. Notice as individuals, we should be blessed as we read. We should be blessed as we hear. And we will be blessed when we heed the message of Christ. This is one reason why I'm so happy 
that we still have people who love the Bible. And some of the things that you read, it's the Bible is still one of the best sellers, but not necessarily high up on the reading list. But there are those, notice, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words and the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. We are to take into account the prophecies and the predictions, but we are to keep it in proper context and in relationship. And we need to be men and women of the book. We need to be those who read the book. We need to be those who hear the words of the prophecy. And above all else, we need to be more than hearers of the word. We need to be doers of the word. We read it, we listen to it when it is spoken, and then we take it to heart and we heed the things and we respond accordingly. So let us honor the heavenly family as we faithfully partake in the tribulation, kingdom, and perseverance in Jesus. Notice, I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance which are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Notice, please notice the context that we find ourselves. First of all, notice that John identifies with the brothers and the sisters. But notice what follows. John, your brother, and your fellow partic partaker, your fellow participant, notice in what? In three things, in the tribulation, in kingdom, and in perseverance. The term the is a word that is used to structure what follows, that the term tribulation and kingdom and perseverance should be looked at as a unity, a conceptual unity where they are all bound together. And we are bound together in what? In the kingdom, the kingdom that is and the kingdom that is coming in the perseverance that is and the perseverance that is coming. And notice that we support one another in love as we live in the same environment. So let us renew our vow in serving Jesus Christ that we will be evangelists, that we will be people of prayer, that we will be men and women who pray for one another who pray for the lost, who read the word, who study the word, who live the word. Life will not be any easier. Sometimes it's worse. I've mentioned from this pulpit before, one of my best friends in seminary was very active in evangelism in his own family, and he led his aunt to the Lord, and all of a sudden one day nobody could find the aunt. And they asked the husband. He didn't know. Nobody knew. Well, the husband got so angry because the his wife accepted the Lord. He went and got some kind of a doctor and had her put in a psycho psychology hospital all tucked away and didn't tell anybody. You pay a price sometime when you're a Christian because you're a Christian. But it doesn't mean that it goes unnoticed and it doesn't mean that God is angry. What it means is we are fellow partakers in the tribulation, the kingdom, and the perseverance. The perseverance all of these, notice, come from the Lord Jesus Christ. And these are the things that make us who we are and who we ought to be. May the Lord cause us to be committed to one another on those three points, on the kingdom, the tribulation, and the perseverance. This is what it means to say, Jesus is my Lord. Our Father, as we come to you in prayer, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you that he is the king of kings, that he rules over all the kings. And when we find so many men and women in government today, whether it's in the United States or elsewhere, they seem to think that they are of some kind of divine nature, which is far from the truth. But we ask that you will continue to work, and we thank you that you will continue to work throughout the current events, and that you will bring them all to that point where every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. Until such time, make us persevering saints. Make us 
working saints. Make us people to do your will and do your pleasure. In Christ's name we pray, amen.